Vanilla Project initiated in Western. Euro reveal plans. And new restaurant and bar set to open. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Sunday's news. More agricultural initiatives are being introduced in Western Province to encourage locals to invest in agricultural activities to sustain their livelihoods. The recent is a vanilla project initiated through a public-private partnership that intends to provide economic opportunities for Western communities. The partnership involves a commitment between the provincial government, Octedi Mining Limited, Innovative Agro Industries and Octedi Development Forum. Initial discussions were led by Ian Middleton as former Chief Executive Officer of OTDF between 2017 and 2019 to introduce agricultural ventures for the benefit of local communities. You go on a reading block blue, you know, you're ready to walk. Because this is the only way that you're going to put money in your pocket after Octedi. So attitude and passing blue, you sense him today. Today and time will change. Following consultations between the provincial government, OTDF contracted Agro Industries as its agribusiness partner to introduce vanilla farming in Western. Through the West Agro Plan, OTDF is addressing food security to ensure a community mine continuation agreement legacy exists beyond the mine closure. The only employer that we platine where we can invest to pull everybody, including myself, my kids, my wife, down to my village people, including every person on the street, our grandparents, everybody, or Bubu, Uncle B, Mr. Tablo Place, the only employer where I employ everybody, MDD Man walked us. In Western Province, a large proportion of the land is covered by water. Thus, agricultural or livestock farming can be a real challenge for locals. However, through innovative technologies, such program gives locals economic opportunities. The provincial government has also invested 4 million kina into this program. Within the next Three years then, and vanilla will come up in this. You don't have gold and have to sell vanilla. But you can sell it like some money for you. This program also aims to prepare CMCA communities for a smooth transition from subsistence to commercial farming. We are learning, we are still learning how to look after this thing here. How to make it grow so that it bears the what? fruit that will go on the market. Since 2017, locals in Moorhead in the South Fly District have been farming vanilla. But through this agricultural investment, the agro industries aim to double the production of vanilla in Western. This project is going to produce in the first phase 20 ton. Okay, but this is not where we are aiming. We are aiming to double the production of Papua New Guinea. And we can do it. I cannot say easily. Not, nothing is coming easy in agriculture. Okay, agriculture is a tough, uh, is a tough things, and it's not easy to produce good product. But Papua New Guinea can double their production of vanilla within five, six, seven years from now, for sure. OTML, being the major investor in Western Province, has over the years supported communities through profits and other benefits from the mine. It also committed a funding support towards this initiative that is aimed at sustaining the lives of locals. Octavia's commitment, not this project, because people are looking positive legacy by staff before Octavia go. And we've made an initial commitment of 6 million kina towards this project. Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. 
Higher Education Minister Nick Kuman has highlighted the need for better teacher training programs to help improve the quality of education in the country. He says the quality of education in the country has dropped due to poor teacher training programs. Minister Kuman was speaking during the groundbreaking ceremony of a new teachers college in Kyunga recently. Speaking to the people of Kyunga in Western Province, the Higher Education Minister says there has been a significant drop in quality of education in the country. To help address this issue, teachers' colleges in the country are accepting grade 12 school leavers with a grade point average of 2.4 and above. But there is not enough space in institutions to cater for the increasing number of students. Any, any GPA below 2.4 is not allowed. So 2.4 and above is accepted. But these days, a lot more students score better results, and I acknowledge the... Teacher training programs has been a problem in the country for many years. According to the Higher Education Minister, the quality of education has dropped dramatically over the last 15 years, particularly in mathematics and science. This has seen a decrease in the number of students getting into medical schools and other colleges. We need to produce a lot more doctors in this country, a lot more nurses, a lot, a lot more HCOs to be in the hospitals. We don't have doctors in the rural health centers in this country, as I speak. That is because of the quality of education in the country. The Higher Education Minister adding that better teacher training programs must be introduced to help address this problem, and that is to introduce content-oriented teacher training program in colleges. This means a teacher must be trained in a specific subject. General teachers, yeah, it's a jack of all trades, but master to nothing. Master of none, you have, doesn't have any, uh, any uh, strength in the, uh, the subjects they teach. And we want to see that we are encouraging all the teacher training institutes right throughout Papua New Guinea, including University of Goroka. With the government emphasizing on science and technology in the country, schools were also urged to offer science, technology, engineering and mathematics or STEM courses. STEM subjects is the important subject that every college must embrace and they must be trained. And those knowledge should be imparted into our STEM program long, through long, the standard-based education curriculum. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. It comes with great expectations that the Million Kina funded Alutau Town Market will do more than just enhance revenue income for vendors in the province. With plans for a cross-sectorial benefit approach already underway, the Mill Bay Tourism Bureau made its plans known on how best it can leverage of the market to boost tourism in the province. This after the market had just recently gone through a massive facelift and now also accommodates a fisheries facility. Possibly the largest infrastructure development in the Million Bay Provincial Capital is the jointly funded Alotal Town Market and the potential is endless in terms of tourism. And in terms of tourism, uh, it's been very conveniently situated between the National Kenu and Kundu Festival Ground and also the Alice Wedega Park, which is all our sporting activities and the iconic Cameron Club is just a stone's throw away. And so, and the town center and the CBD is just accessible, as you can see. So, tourism-wise, we see that this infrastructure here is going to serve a, a very important purpose uh, in the years to come. The Bureau foresees holding events and functions during major festivals near or close to the market's spacious grounds. Also for the tourists, uh, they finally, you know, we can finally offer them a modern market that has modern amenities and is presenting a sale of, of, of food and vegetables, craft, and eventually also um, fish to them in a standard that is uh, also accepted uh, internationally, you know, so. Having such an infrastructure opens up the tourism appeal for the province. The Bureau anticipates this will help to satisfy the expectations of international tourists who come through the province. And so when tourists come, uh, definitely this is going to be an iconic feature. And, you know, tourism sector with uh, provincial government, with the HUHU, LLG, 
uh, we really look forward to uh, working together to extend the utility of the infrastructure just for, you know, beyond just being a market, but as a multi-purpose uh, uh, asset. Alatao MP Charles Abel spoke highly of the tourism potential, shedding light on PNG's first ever tourism loan from the World Bank. Some of our plans here in the township um, to facilitate the infrastructure of the town, but not only that, link it back into the tourism uh, sector, in particular to integrate it better with the cruise ship tourism. Uh, Alatao was getting almost one cruise ship a week until COVID hit. And... Um, I've said before, but we invested 45 million into the International Wharf to make that possible. Uh, Papua New Guinea had the first ever um, tourism loan through the World Bank that was to benefit Kokopo and Alatau in, in the first stages. And uh, we were trying to complete our mall, the footpath, the toilets, linking out to the wharf and then linking into the market, the new craft uh, market that was the old temporary market uh, over there in our culture museum and also up the new East Cape Highway and linking back into the other districts of Millen Bay where tourists can come and go and our people can also come and go. And at Cora, National MTV News. The Intercontinental Hotel Group, PNG, in partnership with OPH Limited, will be celebrating the official opening of the Port Terrace restaurant and bar tomorrow. Board of directors and members of the media were taken on a private viewing of the gastropub. MTV's Yana Zuriri with more. Located in Crown Plaza residences within the larger number one super plaza, Along McGregor Street, downtown Port Mosby, the Port Terrace restaurant and bar can be best described as a gastro pub, a hybrid of pub, bar, and restaurant. The restaurant and bar shows off a sleek and modern interior setting in a relaxed and spacious environment, with a majestic breathtaking view over the Fairfax Harbor. Its European bar will serve some of the best quick bites to share platters to pub regulars like beggars, fish and chips, and steaks. And we really think this number one super plaza precinct has enormous potential. It's going to be a great destination for people to come to. It's got great features. It's got retail opportunities. It's got commercial opportunities. It's got fantastic panoramic views. It's got the Deloitte Tower over here, the penthouse building over here. It's going to be really, really good as a destination in its own right. We think it'll be fantastic. So for us to be able to open up the restaurant and, of course, the Meeting space. We've got great meeting spaces upstairs with um, boardroom, lounge, gym. It's going to be a really, really fabulous little spot. Its diverse customer base ranges from in-house hotel clients, business travellers, experts and local workers from nearby offices and residential suburbs. It is a place where one can enjoy delicious meals and unwind when the city's stunning sunsets are wash the sky with splendor. Yana Zoriri, National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. We'll be back with more stories from abroad after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas with just three days to go, Donald Trump and Joe Biden have held dwelling rallies in the battlefield of Florida, a state that could decide the results. The fight for Florida is on. A couple of old stages in their 70s, giving it all they've got. The winner here could really take it all. So I'm thrilled to be here in my, our home state, Florida. It's up to you. You hold the key. If Florida goes blue, it's over. Right now, Florida is Republican reap for Trump. What Trump has done in the past four years is incredible. I think Trump wins in a landslide, except with some of the corruption that could happen. 
But the latest polling shows it could go blue for Biden. The Democratic candidate is on 48.6%, while Trump is on 46.5%. Millions of Americans are already voting. Millions more are going to vote by the end of this week. Florida is a massive state and is critical because it has a lot of what's called electoral college votes, 29 of them. The winner needs 270. So all guns out in the Sunshine State. This country deserves a president with proven results, not empty words and promises. Yet more words and more promises about COVID-19. We're never going to lock down again. We locked down, we understood the disease, and now we're open for business, and that's what it is. I'm not going to shut down the economy. I'm not going to shut down the country, but I'm going to shut down the virus. And the virus is raging. Today, 89,940 new cases, a record, the worst day ever. Two Trump supporters at a rally in North Carolina tested positive, and at this Florida rally, few wearing masks and no social distancing, and people collapsing in the heat. Florida, Florida, Florida. It has chosen the president before. In 2000, it was the decisive state, but in the end it was close and it fell to the highest court in the states to decide that George W. Bush had won. If it is close again, there could be a repeat of that. So an election on the edge could end up here, the Supreme Court. Its motto is equal justice under the law, but its decisions are made by a majority of its judges agreeing. There's nine of them. And Donald Trump has stacked it so that six of them are Republican appointments, raising fears that any controversial decision could go his way. More than 80 million Americans have already voted, suggesting the country could be headed for the biggest voter turnout in over a hundred years. France has again become the target of a horrific terror attack. Three people were killed, two of them decapitated in a church in Nice. Radical Islamists are being blamed for the attack. Gunfire ringing out from Nice's Notre Dame Basilica. <laughs> as stunned neighbours filmed from their balconies, watching police take down a man who had just moments earlier beheaded a parishioner inside before continuing his stabbing rampage, which left a man and another woman dead and a number of others with serious injuries. Nice's mayor was at the scene, saying there are no doubts on the motivations of the attacker, who was repeatedly saying Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. A gurney left not long after. On it could have been the suspect who was shot, but not fatally. French media report he's a 21-year-old migrant from Tunisia who arrived just weeks ago. President Emmanuel Macron travelled to Nice and didn't hold back his sentiments, saying once again our country has been hit by an Islamic terrorist attack. This morning three of our compatriots fell at Notre Dame Basilica in Nice. Very clearly France is under attack. That's because not long after the Nice attack, there was another one in nearby Avignon where a man with a handgun was threatening passers-by. He was shot dead by police. And in Lyon, police arrested a man wearing a bulletproof vest and brandishing a foot-long knife. Si nous sommes attaqués. If we are attacked once again, Macron says, it is for our values, for our freedom. We are not to give in to any kind of terror. I say it with great clarity once again today, we will not give in. It comes just weeks after teacher Samuel Patia was beheaded in Paris after teaching his students about the controversial Islam mocking covers of magazine Charlie Hebdo. Nice is no stranger to terror attacks. Four years ago, 86 people died when Islamic terrorists drove a truck through crowds celebrating Bastille Day. Today's attacks coincided with All Saints Day, known in Islam as Prophet Muhammad's birthday. 4,000 extra troops have been deployed across France, many outside churches, as France once again grapples with a tragedy carried out by a radicalised minority. New Zealand has voted in a referendum to keep cannabis illegal. Although the numbers were close as expected, the Prime Minister and Treasurer have revealed how they voted. 
Grins at say nope to dope after New Zealand did just that. We don't expect young people to applaud us for it, but we know that we've done the right thing by them. Less jubilant at Helios. Its slabs will eventually be filled with cannabis, but only the medicinal kind. It had hoped to expand to recreational cannabis too. We're losing a chance to um, create some real societal benefits and reduce harm and change our approach to controlling cannabis. Others hoping for a yes vote today include students and justice reformers. For them, it was cold pizza instead of a party. Obviously we are really disappointed. We have worked over the last couple of months to make sure that young people and students especially um, get out and vote yes. And disappointed in the Prime Minister. I am disappointed that the Prime Minister did not say how she was going to vote. I think that courage and political leadership are really important. The Prime Minister resolutely refused to state her position throughout the last term. I don't see my job is to influence people's vote. It's my job to implement the outcome that voters choose. I made a clear decision that I want the public of New Zealand to decide this and I want this not to be about politics. Andrew Little revealing his vote on News Hub's referendum special. Were you a yes vote? Yes. Finally today, the Prime Minister revealed she voted yes for recreational cannabis in a statement. Do you think if the Prime Minister stuck in her car and said that she did vote yes, could it have swayed her? I'm in the Greens because I have the courage of my convictions. The courage of her convictions and confidence the vote could still swing. Nearly half a million special votes haven't been counted yet. So there's every chance that this does flip when it comes to the specials, but again it will be that razor-thin margin. But those remaining votes would need to return a 67% yes vote to flip the result. I think it's entirely plausible. I think that if anybody had tried to predict anything about this election, least of all that I would be sitting here as the leading candidate in Auckland Central, especially based on the polls, uh, we would be having a very different conversation. The referendum results are such that it is highly unlikely that those results will be overturned on the specials. Campaigners pulling down signs but holding on to hope. A group of Queenstown school leavers have enjoyed a special graduation treat, a free bungee jump. It's a tradition of the local operator AJ Hackett aimed at giving teens a rewarding challenge before they leave the region. A 43 metre leap off the historic Kawaro Bridge and a leap into the unknown for these Queenstown teenagers. When I was standing on the edge it was super scary but once you kind of fall all my nerves left because I, I was hugging tightly onto my body Annie. <laughs> Final year students from Wakatipu High School celebrating the end of their school year. Very very nervous okay it's fine. As they launch into the next stage of their lives. I guess I've never really bungeed up before. I was always kind of too scared to book it and make myself go through with it. This is the 15th year the Jumpstart program has been offering the free jumps in Queenstown. We wanted to do something for the kids that had grown up with bungee so that when they were getting ready to, to finish school and leave Queenstown they had a little part of that that they could take away themselves. Van Ash joining in the celebrations, tandem jumping with an excited Ella Lanyol. We're literally jumping off a bridge to send off our time at school, so I think it's an awesome opportunity to celebrate. The Kawaro Gorge Jump is the world's first commercial bungee jumping site. These jumps are a way of giving back to the community for AJ Hackett. We know that this gives the kids a great self-esteem boost. They, they, they start off being scared. They work out that it's actually about their heads and their hearts. Another hundred school leavers are set to take the plunge here over the weekend. And when we return, we bring you a closer look. Stay with us. Welcome back. Over the past three years, the PNGDF's Joint Services Training College in Lace Egan Barracks has trained cadets who are now commissioned officers serving in the police, defence force and correctional service institutions across the country. Since its inception, the key aspects emphasised on in training has been leadership and networking for cadets across these institutions. In October, we were given an insight into how the JSC trainings are conducted during the senior class's final exercise. While taking a closer look at the Academy's exercise last chance, we will also take a brief look at the Academy's history.
The Sitome area in Morabe's Nawai district became the exercise grounds for the 37 cadets in the PNGDF's Joint Forces Academy's senior class. After their incession on the 25th of September, they started exercise last chance with the defensive operations. The cadets built gun pits, barricaded their fighting bays, establishing the defensive positions. These gun pits home for the next 14 days. Yeah. So they sleep and then fight in this bay. So every time you make changes for Plum Kumara, Plum Kumara and Plum Sergeant occupies their back position and uh, this is their fighting bay. During this period, each cadet is assessed on their ability to apply the skills and tactics learned over the past two years, one key component being their ability to lead. Okay, uh, it is important because in order for an officer, especially during the uh, you know, operational time, times, a cadet or an officer must be able to understand the higher commander's intent understand the situation on the ground and make decisions based on the overall outcome of the intent high up. And he or she needs that leadership quality that needs to be taught to him or her. For the first eight days, the cadets were stationed in the bush carrying out their defensive and offensive operations. Tasks that involved guarding the base camps and resupplying the training camp and evacuating injured cadets on stretches for more than a kilometer using bush tracks. While the defensive and offensive operations were set in the bush away from civilians, the stability operations that followed were set in crowded areas. This involved protecting assets. In this scenario, the Situm Health Center, School and Communications Tower. These are exercises depicting real-life situations that these cadets will have to deal with when they become commissioned officers and commanders in their institutions. Fight through, fight through. In Papua New Guinea, the situations often dealt with by disciplinary forces involve internal security operations. These are civil disputes, protests or unrests, or events such as the national general elections. In this scenario, the cadets were transported by chopper from Sitom to Unitec. Here, they conducted their crowd control exercise an activity that involved handling a rowdy mob. These 37 cadets from the PNGDF and Correctional Service Institute are jointly trained at the Joint Forces Academy. This arrangement has its advantages, one of them being the networks formed across their institutions. It gives an insight into how the different institutions are trained to respond in situations and an understanding of their roles and areas of operations. While the offensive and defensive operations are largely based on defense force training, the scenarios given during the stability operations depict situations that the CIS officers are trained to respond in. When we uh, have a joint force policy and when the police and CIS come together, it's uh, an extra to, to bind uh, you know, those institutions together. And it builds, you know, national scene where we can deal with issues where it's a law and order and, and police and uh, PNG defense to do that task. We already have that knowledge. Oh, I know this guy. I know this uh, female officer. We work together. So it makes the job easier in terms of, you know, dealing with police and, and, and CSO, PNG def outside. So networking is a big key. And also, I see that. In the long run, it has to assist to you know nation building. Uh, we all work to work together as a team, and it cut, uh, cuts out those issues of oh, police doing their own thing, PND did there. Everybody understands. Exhausted and sleep deprived from the 14-day exercise, they had one last tasking to end the training. It was the fight and withdraw phase on the last day, which started at the break of dawn. While withdrawing from an advancing enemy party, they were tasked to carry three injured soldiers along the way. 
This was their exit from the training grounds and the start of the 26-kilometer route march back to the Egan Barracks. For the past two years, each of these cadets have been exposed to roles of the section to platoon commanders. In the final exercise, this was tested as each of them took turns in exercising their roles as section commanders. Officer Cadet is taught how to lead as a section commander. He or she is taught the level of the basic section level in the PNG, which is a corpus uh, leadership. So that when he or she becomes a lieutenant, he or she understands that that uh, leadership at that level should have been covered. So he or she can you know, understand what's going on at the bottom. Next, they go to the next leader of platoon level, which is a platoon command. And that's the one that is emphasized in our training here. He or she, the officer care, must be able to lead or have the, the qualities to lead a platoon. a platoon. While the current Joint Forces Academy is just four years old, the history of the college goes back to the 1970s. Prior to the college's establishment, there was the military cadet school at the Egan Barracks, providing basic military training for cadets. In 1973, the National Executive Council approved the establishment of the Joint Services Training College, which now catered for the Defense, Police and Correctional Service cadets. The college operated for five years until the last batch graduated in 1980. Amongst those cadets who passed out from the early JSC was former Brigadier General Jerry Singirok, former Police Commissioner Gary Bucky, and the former Correctional Service Commissioner Michael Wipo, amongst others. With the demand for good leadership in the disciplinary services and the need to meet regional and cross-border security concerns, the Joint Services Training College was re-established in 2016 after 36 years. When we came through here, it, the, the training centered around leadership and how to lead men and women of the future. So this is the you know, aspiration. I cannot take my old school to, and compare it with this one. This we anticipate to be modern in nature. When we... But the operations of the Joint Services Training College has been anything but smooth. When the college was re-established, then Area Commander Colonel Carl Rakone stressed that the college would need its own budget to run its operations. Funding has been a challenge for the academy for the past four years, and much of the support has been given by Australia through the Australian Defence Force. This is something that the JSC Chief Instructor Lieutenant Colonel John Bannock hopes will be fixed with the recent passing of the Joint Services Bill in Parliament. So uh, things are looking bright next year when we get the funding. Uh, they say it's about 20 million over five years and that should alleviate, uh, alleviate all our problems we're facing. But currently, uh, the previous year and, and this year, the challenges we, uh, we face were funding to get our activities done. Uh, but we've, we've managed with the assistance from the Australian uh, defence staff on the ground who have come to our aid in nearly all our activities and made sure we've, we've uh, produced the results that we, we, we require. Despite these challenges, officers in the JSC have continued to conduct trainings and exercises such as the final exercise with limited funding and resources. To the, the OC or the SIC instructor of uh, Kerebring, uh, Major Edo and his staff, they've done a really you know, tremendous job with the little, little uh, resources that they were given over the 14 days. Uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, activities were conducted. They tried to use the area to create scenarios that were you know, realistic and to, to expose the carriage to what we were expecting them to cover, to get them qualified. So to the staff, you know, I take my hats off to them. They worked hard. Uh, with limited resources, trying conditions, and put the carriage to their faces to, to come to the end of the exercise. So. The current senior class is the fourth batch of intake since the academy's re-establishment. They started with 51 cadets in 2018 and have ended with 37 cadets, amongst them one woman. Exercise last chance is crucial for these cadets as it will determine whether or not they graduate this month. 
For the cadets that have passed through the academy and those yet to, the networks forged within the walls of the college will be a tool used in national joint security operations. Chukai Sports is next. Details after the break. Chukai Sports. Good night and welcome to Trukai Sports. The Ganglove Consulting University Piggies Rugby Union Club yesterday grabbed a crucial win in round eight of the Capital Rugby Union competition here in Port Mosby. The third place side beat competition leaders Credit Corporation Harley Queens seven points to three at the Bava Park Rugby Union Oval. Gangloff Consulting University Piggies yesterday managed to snatch victory over longtime rivals and competition leaders in the Capital Rugby Union competition, the Credit Corporation Harley Queens. A strong showing with both teams eager for a win as the season nears its end in a fortnight's time. With the competition not having a final series, a top four playoff will determine the premiers. With the Piggies who are in third getting a much needed win with two more rounds remaining. The Piggies came into the match as underdogs with the Harlequins with some renewed pride fitted with their new jerseys. A fitting compliment to an impressive season. The Piggies look to experienced forwards George Oki and Wesley Thomas in the opening half with captain Kenneth Vaggie at scrum half taking control of the match. The Harleys led by captain Desmond Korpok and experienced forward Freddy Andale kept the young side strong in defence. The match was not both teams' best effort, with patches of missed opportunities by both teams and errors that slowed the game's pace. But both teams showed real effort in defense and attack despite the scrappy patches in the match. Both teams did, however, struggle to find their footing in the first half, with the game remaining scoreless at halftime. The Harleys managed to pick up their game in the second half but were met with some strong defense. But the Harleys were given an opportunity to get ahead by three points in the match after a successful penalty conversion. The match hung in the balance for both sides but with time running out the Piggies made sure to hold their own inside the Harleys half as the Piggies tried to rumble their way into the try line but it was no easy feat with the Harleys always a tough team to break. But with a string of opportunities keeping the Piggies in the Harleys half, the Piggies finally got the winning five pointer. The 7-3 win a big one for the Pigs. And turning to Rugby Union overseas, the Wallabies Bledisloe Cup drought will continue for the 19th year. The Australians were beaten 43 points to 5 by the New Zealand side in Sydney. Needing to win to keep the four-match series alive, the Wallabies were out nostled from the start as the All Blacks ran in six tries to one to claim their biggest win over their rivals. Australia blooded four debutants in the match and the All Blacks took advantage of the lack of experience. The Wallabies get a chance to salvage some pride next week when they face New Zealand again in Brisbane. And more stories after the break. Stay with us. True Kai Sports. And welcome back to Trukai Sports. To football, Liverpool equal a club record 63 league games unbeaten with a 2-0 win over West Ham. Here's more from ABC. 
Liverpool fought back from a goal down to beat the Hammers in the Premier League this morning. Mohamed Salah levelled the scores just before half-time before Dogo Jota secured the win in the 85th minute. Kyle Walker scored against his old club as Manchester City beat Sheffield United 1-0 to move into the top half of the Premier League. And Chelsea moved to fourth after beating Burnley 3-0. Hakim Ziyech scored a goal and set up another in his first Premier League start. And to tennis, world number one Novak Djokovic is downplaying the worst defeat of his career, knocked out in the quarterfinal of the AFTP's Vienna tournament. The 17-time champion won just three games against Italian Lorenzo Sonigo, demolished 6-2, 6-1. Djokovic could only manage seven winners and sprayed 25 unforced errors. Sonigo is simply stunning in Vienna and Djokovic is simply shell-shocked. Djokovic, though, is still favoured to wrap up the year with the world number one ranking for a sixth time. And that story ends Strukai Sports. The weather forecast for the next 24 hours when we come back. Bye for now. Strukai Sports. True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Fine and sunny in Port Moresby. Mostly fine, although partly cloudy in Daru and Kerma. Morning showers and drizzles, then cloudy in Alotau and morning showers, then fine weather in Popundita. In the Mamasi region, mostly fine, although partly cloudy, with afternoon showers developing in Lee and Vanimo. Fine, although partly cloudy, with afternoon showers developing in Medang, and partly cloudy with showers in Wewak. In the New Guinea Islands region, mostly fine, although partly sunny in Loringa and Buka. Partly cloudy with some afternoon showers in Kaviang, mostly fine, although partly cloudy in Kokopo and Rabaul. Thundery rain showers, then cloudy weather in Kimbe. And in the Highlands region, morning fog clearing to a fine, partly cloudy Evening in Mount Hagen, morning fog patches clearing with drizzles and fine partly cloudy in Goroka and Kundiawa. Morning fog patches clearing for a mostly fine day in Mendi and Wabeg. The weather update was proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. And that wraps up the bulletin for this Sunday. From all of us here at MTV, pleasant viewing. Be safe. Bye for now.